Hi friends, hello and welcome to another video. Today I'm joined by Jerry Gray. Jerry, how are you? I am very well, thank you. A little warm down here in Guangdong, as you know. Oh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Look, um, today we're going to be talking about this particular um, report that has been written by the Heritage House. It's a, a Republican uh, think tank that is preparing a document for the next president of the United States. So this is what we're going to talk about today. It's called Project 2025. And we want to start talking a little bit about the events of just the last uh, 48 hours where uh, an assassination attempt was made on Donald Trump. Why do we want to do that, Jerry? Because it's vitally important and it's very, very strongly related to what we're doing now. I have a view, uh, and I've never had this view until quite recently, that America is on the cusp of a civil war. They, they are. Um, if this had been a successful thing yesterday, there would have been a massive amount of blame apportioned to the Secret Service, which clearly failed in its job. 130 meters, 500 feet away from an, a president was an exposed roof that someone was allowed to climb onto with a rifle and shoot at the president. That's a clear failure of security. Was that deliberate or was that a failure of security? Somebody needs to, to fall for that, uh, somebody in the Secret Service. The second thing was witnesses were telling the police, witnesses were telling the Secret Service, and nothing happened. So hmm. there are going to be, be people who say this was a deliberate attempt to allow someone to kill, or at least attempt to kill the the potential next president. So we're going to get all sorts of conspiracy theories about that. Had he been killed, I think that today America would be poised onto the verge of a civil war. It is that important. And part of the reason that 2025 is important, and also there's another thing, another factor, which came out two or three years ago, which adds to this, and that is the uh, whistleblower, uh, FBI whistleblower report written by Jim Jordan and uh, his cohorts. Uh, about two or three years ago, this came out hugely criticizing the FBI and the Department mm. of Justice for, for being part of the political framework of what is going on in America now when they should have been part of the uh, law enforcement. So there are pillars in the society. There, there's the administration, there's the judiciary, there's law enforcement, and obviously the press. These are all different pillars of society, and they ought to have separation. But it seems according to Jim Jordan and his team, which are right-wing conservative Republicans, who are the same kind of people bringing out the 2025 report. And remember, this is, a, this is actually a book. It's a 900-page book. It, is being, it has been written and it's been published for the next conservative president of the United States. So this is a, a, a manifest or an agenda, whatever we like to call it, for Donald Trump if or when now, I think, when he wins the next election. So had he not been able to stand at the next election, it would only have been because the assassin's bullet actually connected and killed him. Then there's another theory that maybe the whole thing was a setup, but I, I'm not really buying into that one. It's possible, but I'm, I do buy into the possibility that they allowed this to happen. Somebody allowed this to happen because there's just there's so definitely... many big mistakes. There's definitely a couple of things that can be said is that the possibility of him being uh, elected just skyrocketed. And yes. because of that, this Project 2025 uh, has a great deal of chance to become a principle of the presidency of what he is going to do with the presidency. Um, I just want to take one second to remind all our viewers that check the subscribe button because I seem to be losing subscribers again and again and again. Happens to you, happens to me. So make sure to check that you are still subscribed to this channel. And if you have never been subscribed, then make sure to hit the subscribe button since it's the first time for you being here. Um, so look, let's talk a little bit about um, what the the whole Project 2025 is about. Um, it's it's a book about the challenges that are facing the American people and uh, the next conservative president. It, it goes a very, very um, long, long distance into talking about every single aspect of the world that they want to control and how they want to control it. But I, I would like us to just focus on China since we're both based here in China. There'll be 
here and there aspects I will mention about other places, but mostly about China. Um, I think that this whole thing is about China, actually. I would say 75% of the whole book is about China. They talk about um, some of the issues are what they call supranational policymaking, mm -hmm. whatever that means. They talk about border security. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they talk about border security and, and they say, well, all this <laughs> military age Chinese people coming into, into China through the border, going through the Darien and walking all the way through Central America. They're talking about globalization. That's China right there, engagement with China. They talk about manufacturing. That's China's um, forte. Big tech, which is huge, huge um, here in China. And um, basically the issue with Beijing compromised colleges. Those are the different topics. And as you can see, 85% uh, of them are about China. So um, which one would you like to start talking about? And then we take it from there, Jerry. Is there anything that, that caught your attention from uh, going through did, this book? Did you mention or did you skip over the military buildup of China there as well? Well, that has to do with, with the engagement with China, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to be honest here. I only opened this book yesterday. It's 922 pages and I opened an electronic copy of it, started to read it, and thought, "Oh my God, I'm, you know, we're going to talk about this tomorrow. I'm not going to get, uh, I'm not going to get an in-depth coverage of it." So yeah, uh, I say that the book has, uh, I think, four keys, and it has two points that it wants to make. Four of the keys are: it's anti-woke, it is anti-elite, it is anti-immigration, and it is anti-China. They're the four keys that I've taken away from this. But then there's the two points, and I wrote them down here, uh, two fundamentals that, and the book actually says this, or the, in the foreword of the book, it actually says this. There are two fundamental aspects to this book. One is that China is, and I'm quoting here, a totalitarian enemy of the United States. That's number one. Number two, American elites have betrayed the American people. And I think coming back to these two things they're actually the same thing this is not two points this is one point america did not uh well america got rich it didn't have all of its ip all of its factory work all of its manufacturing all of its stem cell stem research all the, it didn't have all of those things stolen by china it gave them to china where it wanted to, it did. Where it didn't want to, it didn't. They will say that China coerced them. Okay, well, China said, look, if you want to open a factory here for your big stores and big, you know, you want to do that, then you're sharing the technology with us. Your choice. Is that coercion? The World Trade Organization doesn't seem to think so. The United States worked very, very hard to instill its values into China, and it failed. Now, what values was it trying to instill into China? Because... According to the conservative, uh, the right in America, everything that America stands for now under what they call the progressive left is pretty evil. This whole book writes about the evils of the progressive left. And yet, everything that they want is exactly what China actually has. So mm -hmm. I, I see this huge <laughs> contradiction here, a massive contradiction. Everything that America wants, it wants to bring power back to the manufacturing industries, it wants to bring power back to the workers, and it wants to bring its manufacturing back home, and it wants the power of the democracy to be run by the people, not by the elites. And I would say, well, China's not your enemy here. China needs to be your mentor here because you can learn everything that there is to learn from China on how to do it properly because China had a revolution 70 years ago. They had to go through it because the revolution was exactly the same situation where the elites had taken over the country and were sucking the lifeblood out of it. So all of the fundamental problems that I see in the 2025 thing are exactly what China had to overcome 70 years ago. I, I find interesting what they say about the need to solve their manufacturing problems. Obviously, these corporations sold their uh, jobs 
to China. They brought them to China and they sold the middle class of America and they left them behind. And that has been 30 or 40 years of that. The solution that these uh, right wing extremists, <laughs> if we could call them that way, is they say that they will solve this problem not by trimming and reshaping the leaves. And I'm reading from the text itself, but by yeah. reaping yeah. out the trees, the root and yeah. the branch. Out the root. That's right. Yeah. Basically, they want to end all economic engagement with China. Um, how? How are you going to go about doing that? You don't have the, the logistics, the capability that China does. You don't have the educated workforce or, or the people who are willing to sacrifice to, to go to factories and do all the things that are necessary to become the factory of the world as China is. You might be able to rebuild some, but to completely cut ties with Chinese manufacturing is really, I, I don't know how they think they can do this. Um, what is your take on, on, on that part of uh, the, the, the cutting China out of the their economy? <clears throat> okay, in one word, it's impossible. That's two words, isn't it? <laughs> it's impossible. Um, effectively, let's go back 70 years when China was in the process of a revolution, post-war, post-Second World War, China was in a civil war, and America came out of the Second World War as the manufacturing country of the world. It had it all. And we watched. I, I'm, I'm not quite old enough to remember that, but I do remember the 60s. We grew up <laughs> believing America. Yeah, I was there. I was too young to be not there. If you remember that saying, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. I, I was uh, I was two when the 60s started. I was 12 when it finished. When when the 60s were, were going on, America was it was the land of the free. It was the home of the brave. It had everything. Yeah. All the big cars. All of, we looked at American cars and went, "Wow!" It had washing machines and dishwashers and electric kettles. And you know, my mother didn't get her first washing machine until I was like 10 years old. Uh, we never had a dishwasher at home, but Every time I saw, I'll tell you what I really impressed me when I was a kid, they would pick up the phone in the kitchen and walk mm. away on the telephone. Our phone was attached to the wall. You know, they had all of these things. America was once a great country. And why can't they go back to that? And the simple fact is they can't go back to that because they have lost the skills needed to run those factories. Now, we can all say factories can be run by robots but they've lost the skills needed to build the robotics. Now, what mm -hmm. we do need to know, or what they do need to understand, is that China has all of those skills. It has developed them. It has not stolen their IP to do this because they don't have it. It has not stolen hypersonic technology because they don't have it. It has not mm -hmm. stolen space technology because they don't have it. It is. It has done nothing except developed from what it had, and none of that was stolen. If it was stolen, it would have been proven at the World Trade Organization, but it can't be proven at the World Trade Organization because there it's is no happening. World Trade Organization arbitration because America has blocked it. So America complains that China doesn't follow the rules, but then refuses to allow the rules to be arbitrated upon. So all of these things <laughs> all add up to, you know, this is this is kind of blame gaming. Uh, is it, this is, that's all it is, a blame game. You're, um, you're touching into a very interesting, you're, you're touching an interesting part, sorry, um, uh, right. about the international organizations that this is something that they write about. Um, they basically are saying that if an international organization or an international agreement is going to erode their constitution, their rule of law or mm -hmm. popular sovereignty, it should just be abandoned. So they're talking again about abandoning international organizations and then they complain that that the world is playing by different rules and that, that they want a different set of rules that basically just work for them, not against them. Uh, for example, think about Trump when he was president. What what did he abandon? He abandoned, uh, was it, uh, <laughs> he abandoned the, the Iran talks. He abandoned the Paris Agreement. He abandoned... I think he was at one point um, thinking of defunding the WHO. So he did defund the WHO. He, he walked out of the WHO. Biden walked back in. He walked out. Nikki Haley, the lovely Nikki Haley, walked mm. out of the United Nations Human Rights Commission. They abandoned pretty much everything. 
You and they want to do more of that. And I, and I don't think many people quite realize this. The United States Constitution says all men are created equal. Or, or is that yes. the Constitution or is that the, um, uh, the uh, Declaration? Declar I, Declaration? The United yeah. States says all men are created equal. But that's not true. All men are created equal if they are United States citizens and if they are white Anglo-Saxon United States American citizens. That's who are created equal. And even then, only if you don't live in a trailer and you've got a university degree that you're paying for until you're 43 years old, then you're created equal. And if you're not one of those people, you're not equal. The United States do not recognize equality anywhere in the world. The, 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 the very fact that the, the papers and the media today are completely full of Donald Trump's ear getting, I don't know if he got shot or hit by a piece of glass as a ricochet, I don't know what happened. Donald Trump got a cut on his ear. Right. Okay. 190 people died in Gaza. I didn't see that very much in the newspapers today mm -hmm. because Donald Trump's ear has taken it over. And this, this is a, all men are not created equal. Donald Trump is far more equal than the rest. You know, we, we've, we've got ourselves in the Orwellian speak there. Donald Trump is more equal than 190 dead Palestinians. How is that possible? So all men are not created equal. Only white, Anglo-Saxon, American-born, middle-class men are created equal. And not even the women. Yeah, so, that is true. Yeah, it's something that needed to be said. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, no. Um, another thing that, that I think that we need to worry about is what they want to do to counter China, because China is front and center in this paper and this book. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that I find more really worrying and concerning, uh, because we also heard NATO talking about this during the 75th anniversary they were celebrating in Washington just a couple of days ago, they were talking about the Belt and Road Initiative and what they plan to do. Now, about NATO, they are talking about actually seizing some of these Belt and Road Initiative projects because they're owned by China. If China continues to allegedly support Russia in the war in Ukraine, that is actual theft. We're talking about just stealing Belt and Road Initiative projects in Europe uh, just, just because they want to and they have the power. So we're seeing a trend of activity, taking money from Afghanistan, taking money from Russia, take, you know what I mean? And now they're threatening to taking Belt and Road Initiative projects in Europe, was NATO. But this particular um, book talks about what they call the Special Operation Forces. And one of the things that they want to do is to counter the Belt and Road Initiative globally by De dedicating the Department of Defense and the Pentagon to go and proactively counter the BRI around the globe. But take a moment to understand what this means. Um, it basically means that a, a an economic, a development project that is supposed to help the countries around the globe to, to develop, to get better, to... Uh, enrich themselves and, and, and link themselves into a trade network around the world, now is going to be targeted by the Department of Defense of the United States. Now it's going to be targeted by the Pentagon, which is a defense. What does that mean? What, what do you make of this, uh, Jerry? It just means that the only answer to any problem that the Americans have is guns. That's it. The only answer to any problem they have is guns. They don't understand diplomacy. They 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 effectively have uh, coercive diplomacy. They don't have diplomacy. You either agree with us or we sanction you. You either continue to agree with us or we'll bomb you. If if your sanctions aren't going to work, then we're going to bomb you. NATO is meeting right now or this week. Yeah, NATO the NATO meeting starts this week. Uh, and it is meeting with a view to expanding to the Pacific. They, mm. they've, they've created this term Indo-Pacific, and effectively what they want to do is they want to control the region around Malaysia. The Malaysians don't want that. They want to control the oceans around Malaysia so that they can prevent things coming in and out of China, which is where 
almost everything comes in and out of in that region. They want to uh, have a NATO office in South Korea and in Japan. They invited Australia to the NATO summit in Washington this week with a view to opening or inviting NATO, uh, Australia into NATO. Now, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, some, some Americans think it's the North American Treaty Organization. No. It's not, it's the North, North Atlantic. Atlantic. Yes, yeah, not, <laughs> nothing to do with North America. It's North Atlantic. It was set up after the war to defend against oppression from perhaps Russia. That was pre pretty much the only enemy that they had. Well, not so much Russia, but USSR. That was the only one that they thought. And they, again, this is only a perceived enemy. It's not a real enemy. It's a perceived enemy. I, I made this challenge the other day to someone on Twitter. Can you please tell me what Vietnam ever did to threaten America hmm. so that America went to Vietnam and 55,000 Americans died there and three or four million Vietnamese died there? What was the actual threat that you felt in America from these rice farmers? Same thing is happening now. They're now saying, okay, we're going to go into Africa and we're going to use our military to take over or stop. I mean, th there's no plan involved in this. It's just a concept right now. We're going to hand over the Belt and Road Initiative countermeasures to the Pentagon. Well, if the Pentagon's doing it and NATO's involved in it, that means war. It's as simple as that. This is nothing defensive. The, the Department it mean, of Defense... It means bombs, bombs and destruction. It doesn't really mean building things or improving things. I mean, no. tell me tell me one time where NATO has actually improved a situation. They haven't. It's just a, a defense organization, according to them, but the world knows that that's just not what it is. Um, one well, of the things that they... Really they disagree with you at, at the moment because they've just got NATO and maybe that's helping their economy, getting thousands and thousands of troops moved onto the uh, the borders, the border area. I think NATO's, uh, Finland's now got 15 different military bases mm. and that'll be good for their economy, but it'll be very bad for their crime rate. Yeah, for the rape like it happens in Okinawa. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Look, I think, I think that one of the focus that this, this book uh, goes at length is the threat of China and the threat is the first island. They say that um, Taiwan is the risk. And, and it's interesting to, to notice that when they talk all throughout this book, they don't talk about allies, they talk about American interests and they see Taiwan just as an economic interest. They do not want the cheap manufacturing to uh, go away or uh, end up in the hands of Beijing. So they see Taiwan and its cheap manufacturing as theirs. We heard Gina Raimondo talk the other day. So like, uh, we have the most developed chips. And then that was lovely from the 60 minute interviewer. I forgot her name. We said like, you mean Taiwan? Taiwan. Like, oh, good point. Good point. Good point. Okay. But here's the fear that Washington has and that this uh, Republicans have. They say that if China is able to subordinate Taiwan or some of its uh, American allies like the Philippines, South Korea, and Japan, it could break apart any balancing coalition that is designed to prevent Beijing's hegemony over Asia. Now, here's a couple of things to understand. Number one, Philippines, in my opinion, is going to be the trigger. Uh, we've talked about this in different shows, uh, you and I, right, when we talked about the four new bases that um, Bonbon Marcos has given to the United States. But they're being pushed to create an incident and that incident is going to be used as a false flag to then trigger the whole domino effect and engage every other base around China to 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 start basically another proxy situation that's what NATO has invited South Korea Japan and all these countries to to the meeting that's why they're building bases and they are basically getting ready for action to take place. Now, the thing to discuss um, about this, and you have said it many times, is that they always point to China's military buildup. But what is China to do when you're building all these bases, when you're building all these um, alliances, military alliances, ready to pounce at you? What are you to do? So, 
is 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 a question of the 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 chicken or the egg. What was first? Well, well, China it, it, China it, it, has this basis around it for decades. Exactly. Yeah, it's quite clear <laughs> what came first. What came first is American aggression or American assertion. Let's call it American assertion for the time being, because if we mm -hmm. go back to the 1950s, it was very much an American way of asserting their dominance in the region. Japan in particular, South Korea during the, the early 50s, since they, they literally invaded South Korea, uh, they invaded Korea, the Korean Peninsula, and then they literally murdered millions of people there. Then they invaded Vietnam and they murdered millions more there. So then it became rather than, than military assertion for, for protection of a, a, a protection against a future third world war. They, then they said, well, this, this is us. We're going to protect this region. Well, yeah, okay. You're protecting this region. But when you, when you start to invade countries that don't want you in there, you're not protecting them anymore. You're invading them. Uh, mm. having done that, China has said, well, we, we don't want this again. If we go back 150 years, China lost Hong Kong, China lost Taiwan, China lost Taiwan to Japan first, and then got it back, and then lost it again to the Republican movement. And, and now it's saying, we haven't lost it, it's ours. And, and this is the true story of it. It's never not been China. So mm. China wants it back in the same way that it got Hong Kong and it got Macau back. Also, a lot of people forget this. There were 46 different concessions, treaty ports, and other properties that belonged to other countries inside of China. In, unless you had a pass. Qingdao. <laughs> Qingdao was one. That was German. Uh, but Qingdao also had an Italian concession. The port of Dalian belonged to uh, the port, port Arthur, it's called in Dalian belonged to the Japanese, and before that it belonged to the Russians, before that it belonged to the, the, the British, which is why it's called Port Arthur. And it's still, it's, it's, now, it's now Dalian's port. Uh, it's in the city of Dalian, which is in China. It's not Port Arthur in, in Scotland, or, or there's a Port Arthur in Australia. I believe there's one in Canada too. And there's, there's actually a place that the British and the, Russian, and the Russians and the Japanese call Port Arthur here in China. And, and these places were taken away by force. And China said, we don't want that to happen again. So they've built a People's Liberation Army. They've built a People's Liberation Navy. And they've built a People's Liberation Air Force to protect the people they liberated in 1947, 1948, during that civil war. They liberated the people from a very a hugely despotic and, and dictatorial government. And people say, yeah, but they're dictator dictatorial. Now. Well, ask Chinese people, which would they prefer? And I know which one they prefer because I do ask them. So what has America done? It has built a, a porcupine. But it's a porcupine that has quills that can shoot. China has built a porcupine to defend itself. These are different things. The mm. Chinese defense is second to none now. And America have just found this out. <clears throat> They've started to realize that they cannot win a land war, that it's impossible. And this book says this quite clearly. So they're mm -hmm. going to restructure the they're US. They're way Marines behind. And, yeah. in, in fact, it goes into about 100 pages of their military. I don't know exactly, but there's a lot of pages <laughs> about their military and how they want to change their military, their military cyber, their military space, their military uh, navy, their air force. All of it needs to be changed. And the strange thing is, after 70 years of their hegemony, they recognize quite clearly that their military is failing them. They can't recruit enough people to get in there because people know they're going to die or get PTSD. And when they come out, they're going to be homeless and not get looked after by the vet Veteran Administration or Veteran Affairs, whatever, the VA. Um, so they, they realize that they're not getting, the people are not getting what they want in America. Again, socialism should work for that. Mm. The people can get their education, get their health, join the Navy, Navy or the Air Force or the, or the Army and be proud of the country. But at the moment, I think a lot of Americans are ashamed. By the way, they just yeah. pulled out of Nigeria and uh, Niger, not Nigeria, Niger, Niger. In Central Africa, they have just closed down their drone air base in Niger because Niger has joined with Mali, Benin, all these countries that used to have an American presence, which had nothing to do with national security and everything to do with the fact they've got uranium, they've got gold, they've got all these minerals and things that Australia, not Australia, sorry, America wanted, 
And so France and America have had to pull out their military because the Africans want it for themselves. Now, the, Afri the, the Americans are now saying, well, the Africans are getting help from China for this. And that's where they're saying China's a threat to them. China's not a threat to them militarily. It's a threat to them economically. It's a threat to their trade in that area because China is buying uranium from them at the market price of uranium. Uh, France was buying uranium from them instead of $74, it was buying it for $12. And, and so Niger and Mali and Benin have just said no more of that. We mm. are now consolidated. They've got their own little NATO pact, militarily <laughs> supporting each other. Defensive. Not so little, actually. They have resources over there, and, and, and they have ways of defending themselves. Um, what, what you mentioned just now is, is, is extremely important, is how they try to frame China um, all over their, their, their messaging. This particular book talks about paints China in a way that is so malign and so it, it makes you scratch your head. Like one of the things that they say when they talk about the lack of political leadership and bureaucratic leadership in America, they say that the, the, the Communist Party of China, the, the CPC, has been at war with the United States for decades. I mean, when you read that, you're like, sorry, what? Sorry, Which what? Which war was that? Did we miss that? No, and, and, and you've been pumping money into China for it to develop and for your corporations to become billionaires and, you know, but you've been at war? For decades, um, but but the, the most worrying part is how they describe is this creation of the enemy, this creation of a monster that you need to attack and you need to defend against. They said that the nature of the Chinese power today is the product of their history, the ideology, and the institutions that have governed China during the course of five millennia. They say that they have inherited all this by present leaders. And this is the new generation of the CPC. So basically, China has been bad for thousands and thousands of years and is the demon that needs to be dealt with around the world. This kind of literature, I mean, who writes this under what kind of mind can you say this? Um, again, very, through very history... Walked mind. Yeah. A very warped mind. Um, if we if we go back 5,000 years of Chinese history, and, and China does have a recognized 5,000 years of, of civilization. It has a written history going back well over 4,000 years. So <clears throat> it is well known and well noted. Now, I, I've often said it doesn't have 5,000 years of continuous history. It has 5,000 years of civilization. China has mm -hmm. been a civilization state for 5,000 years. And it has changed, its borders has changed, have changed, its boundaries have changed, its ideologies has changed a lot. And now it's it's mostly, mostly, uh, this is a, I'm going to give you another, a great word here, Confucian Marxism. So uh -huh. you've got, <laughs> yes, it's a new one, I just made it up. It, it's um, Confucian Marxism is a, is a place where they say, well, Marxism works, but it won't make us all rich. What we need to do is we need to have some capitalism thrown in there. We need to have some pragmatism thrown in there. But we can't let it go unfettered in the way that America has. And the very things, and I keep coming back to this point, the very things that this book criticizes are the very things that China has. So they're criticizing yeah. China for having what they would like the conservative government of America to get. Think about that. So mm. you know, th this is this is really where it does boil down. China is not a threat to America, not in any way, shape or form, except economically. Now, how does America, how should America offset that? By becoming part of China's economic growth. All they need to do is to say to China, can we cooperate with you? And China says, yeah, of course you can. We would, we would like that very much. China would like that. Everything China has ever written is about cooperation. They mm. would like America to cooperate with them. They don't want this. They don't want this war. They don't want military bases all over the place. Now, imagine this. China went to Mexico and it built a BYD factory. Imagine if it went to Milwaukee and built a BYD factory. What would happen? Thousands of people mm. would get jobs. Hundreds of thousands of people would be able to buy a BYD car. 
at the moment they're saying we don't want your BYD cars, so we're going to put tariffs on them. So Americans are not going to get cheap cars. Americans are not going to get jobs, manufacturing jobs, because there aren't any for them. So unless unless America meets China and says we need to work together, which I actually thought Jan, Janet Yellen might have been doing a couple of a year or so ago, the first time she came. All they need to do is to say, okay, we're not going to admit this publicly, but we need you. We're not mm -hmm. going to say we're going to join the Belt and Road Initiative. We're not going to do that. That that would be just too much for our, our pride. Their hubris, their arrogance, and their pride will not allow them to do this. But in all honesty, if they said to BYD, to NEO, to, um, to DJI, look, we want to build a factory here. Can we do that? They'd all say, yeah, sure you can. Sure you can, because that's what we want too. America and China working together. And the, the big one is India and China working together, which is becoming more and more possible now because of what's happening with America interfering in India's politics right now. I just find so it so disheartening when they say, for example, they're actually pushing China against the wall saying like, oh, you are supporting Russia um, with military and double double use um, equipment and whatnot. Have you seen the amount of trade between India and Russia? Yeah. How it has this high rocketed? Do we hear anybody complaining about about India supporting well, the economy of we, Russia? We are starting to see that. We are starting to see that. There was a comment today that said this would be okay if it was G7 ships taking uh, gas uh, under under the cap, taking gas from India to to America uh, to Europe. The the problem is it's not G7. It's India. Indian ships, Russian ships, and Chinese ships are leaving India with Russian gas and taking it into Europe and selling it. And India's making a huge profit. India's the only country that has shown massive growth. I, I think it doubled its GDP. Uh, it's, mm. it's, it's really showing very, very good GDP growth, and it's, and it's going to continue to increase. But just recently, there's been some movement, and America is saying, we can't have that. We're not going to let that continue. And India are probably saying, well, We're a sovereign nation. The only ah. way, the only way you can stop us dealing with Russia is if the United Nations agrees to sanction Russia, because then it would become a United Nations approved sanction and we can stop. Until that happens, you can't tell us who we can trade with and who we can't trade with. The United Nations can, but America can't. And that's what India, I, that's how India is getting away with it. Now, America, because it's a rules based order rather than following any legal system, is saying to China, you don't fit into our rules based order. So we're not going to let you do this and we're going to sanction you for doing it. They're unilateral sanctions. They're not legal sanctions. They don't fit under any World Trade Organization sanction. They don't come under the United Nations sanction. And America cannot legally apply them. But that never stopped America doing anything. So the Indian situation is one where India is saying, well, we're a sovereign nation. We can deal with other sovereign nations. And because of the United Nations Charter on non-interference in the sovereign sovereignty of another nation, you can't stop us from doing it. Now, I want everybody next? to... to to remember what we're talking about right here, because I'm going to be making a video about uh, this concept that is extremely, extremely interesting because it's kind of like India is an example of uh, neutrality the way that it should be. I mean, we can criticize China, uh, India in many ways, but in a way, they're doing neutrality the way that Pascal, uh, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. going to make a video about his his writing and his teaching, his, his phenomenal... He defines neutrality. Is wondering. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave a link to his website uh, in the description. His way of describing neutrality is you're you're the third side of the triangle that kind of like keeps contact with both diverging sides. So uh, that's what India is doing. Like, you want me to stop doing this? Well, show me the legal basis for that. But until that happens, I'm still in contact with both. So that's that's an interesting perspective. And, and, and that approach to neutrality is something that a lot of countries need to learn. I'm talking about the Philippines. I'm talking about Japan. I'm talking about South mm -hmm. Korea. Um, you, you, you do have the option of exercising your sovereignty. You do have the option of uh, becoming 
neutral point. Japan I mean, and South Korea cannot. Right? They're occupied countries. <laughs> Japan and South Korea have no option to, op to. Japan and South Korea must do what America says they must do. There's no question about that. The on paper, on paper, they're sovereign countries, aren't they? On paper, they're occupied sovereign countries. Yeah, they're sovereign <laughs> countries under American control. Um, and so yeah, they they can to a point. Now the interesting thing about India is, is that um, the Modi government has got away with murders, mass murders of uh, Sikhs. It's got away with mass murders and uh, human rights abuses on Muslims and Christians. It's also extrajudicially, it's hard to say that word, killed people outside of India and been proven to have done so. They, they had a nest of spies expelled from Australia. India is not a good corporate citizen. India is not a good nation. It is not, but it gets a free pass on all of these things because of one word, democracy. It's mm. the only thing that stops India and India is today exactly what China was in 1970. India is what America needs to offset China in the way that America needed China to offset Russia in 1970, 71, 72. And they got together and America used India, uh, sorry, in, America used China 50 years ago. Is yes, yeah, it's getting towards 60 years ago, it's a long time, yeah. 1970s. Uh, at the end of the 60s and into the 70s, when they when they normalized relations and opened up to America, uh, America and China opened up to each other, then Russia started to undergo its problems. And so did Vietnam. I mean, they, there was an all, awful lot of stuff going on right there. And, and so we're seeing the same thing happen with India right now. America is going to use India if it can. But India is quite is playing quite a, a good neutrality game, uh, as Pascal says. It is part of that triangle. So but far. America is now starting to take notice of India and say, "You can't do that. It's okay to do that, but you can't do that." You know, they, they're giving them a pass on. You know, they've, they've murdered Sikhs, they've murdered Muslims, they've murdered mm. Christians, and they've murdered people outside of their own country and been proven to have done so. Not, these are not allegations. There's evidence there, much much stronger than any evidence that has been ever been presented about what China is doing wrong, either inside or outside of their own country. China does none of the things that India does, but China gets the accusations. India, even though there's evidence, gets none of them. But the, the I, fact is, Europe would have failed without India. Euro, European I think, I think, European um, industry needed Indian gas. One of the things that this this book talks about is the need to to revamp their whole value system, their whole society, and the education system. Um, mm -hmm. They're failing. They're failing miserably. And this taps into one of the main focuses of the books, which is the, what they call the Beijing infiltration of their universities. They talk about the Confucius Institutes. They talk about TikTok, for example, which they say funnels all the information, all the data, all the way to Beijing, which basically has been proven to not be so. Project Texas is, is basically TikTok's way of saying, like, look, all the data is here. All the data is hosted and 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 preserved here, something that other social media companies don't do, but TikTok does. Um, they also talk about this, this hordes of espionage. I just post, posted a video that, that you retweeted as well, talking about uh, the, the cases of these scientists that were yeah. during Franklin Trump's... Powell. Franklin Tao, during the, uh, Trump's first uh, presidency, he set up this China initiative, which is one of the most unfair, you called it on Twitter, um, racist policies ever, ever come out of, of, of in my lifetime that I can think of. Just being apprehended and being charged without actually looking at the evidence. There was another scientist that was taken and accused of receiving $19 million. Chen Gang. From, uh, yeah. Mm. And, and and basically MIT, where he was, it was like, no, 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 no. It's not him, it's us. 
Like, had, got, had, had, MIT, got the 19 million. had MIT not come out and said that, he would have ended up in, in, in prison for a very, very long time. So yeah. these situations are are only going to get worse, according to this book, because they really, really don't want universities taking money from uh, Beijing or from Beijing entities or from um, they don't want students to to go there and steal their their education values right they say oh you can come here to study humanities and art and social studies but we you we don't want you coming here to learn ai we don't want you to come here and learn this and that we will choose what you can learn and what you cannot learn um that's that to me is the the, the epitome of fear you're there's so afraid. Of, yeah. yeah, there's a couple of major points that, that need to be kind of understood here. One is that, and you nailed it right at the very beginning, you said they need to revamp their education. This is true because their low quality of education and their lack of critical thinking has led them to write the 2025 project. That's mm. a problem. They do not critically look at anything and they just say, I think that's a problem. It's a problem. Do you think it's a problem? Yeah, it's a problem. Okay, so it's a problem. Let's write about it. And that becomes a problem without any critical thinking, any research, and no evidence to support the problem that they think exists. They have closed down more than nearly all the uh, the um, Confucius Institutes. There used to be uh, over 100 of them, and I think now there's less than 10 of them. So they have closed down 90% of them, more than 90% of all the Confucius Institutes. And what does that do? It stops people from studying China, Chinese culture, Chinese language, Chinese psychology. I've studied Chinese psychology. And it stops people from doing that. And when you stop people from studying a topic, you lose the skills, the knowledge, and the experience of that topic. So in other words, when you say to someone, you can't learn Chinese at the Confucius Institutes because it's bad for you, what you're saying is, we don't want you to learn it because it's bad for us. You could become indoctrinated into Chinese ways and you could become more Chinese than American. You have no security in your own culture. If you have American kids learning Chinese values, does that mean they're going to become spies for China? Of course it doesn't. It means they could become spies for America because they understand China if you did that properly. That's one way of looking at it. But the best way to look at it is, Anyone who understands both these cultures has the ability to make their confirmed and better quality decisions. And American leaders, these are these are American elites. These are the, the people they don't like. They call them American elites, but they are the American elites who are writing mm. this, are actually falling into their own little uh, spiral of ignorance. The further down the spiral they get, the more ignorant they become. They're creating their own idiocracy. It is dumb and dumber. <laughs> the two presidential candidates without brain. <laughs> that was me. I wrote that. Yeah. Actually, it was Kate, Kate, it was it was the funniest thing. If anybody follows Caitlin Kate Oz, Caitlin Johnson in Australia, she wrote uh, whew, that was close. We almost had two presidential candidates without a brain. Oh, that was so funny. <laughs> but you concluded in your video that there are actually two without a brain. <laughs> uh, Listen, only in relation to China. <laughs> I want to I want to touch on the last two aspects of this uh, and then we we kind of like wrap it up. One is when they talk about when this book actually talks about space. The the I just put a video out uh in Spanish. Uh oh, you can go to my Spanish channel if you want to guys. Um about the the, the space exploration development of China. It's, it's a wonderful wonderful video. Go to the channel and watch it. But the concern that America has for lagging so far behind in space exploration and for depending so much on private entities like SpaceX and others to, to do the space exploration for the country. But being companies and corporations, they're not beholden to any nationality as such. Um, so that's, that's one thing that they talk about. The other one is, well, the North Pole. And they, their concern is that both Russia and China are starting to pay attention to the resources that are uh, over there. And 
there's plenty of resources. Russia has quite a grasp on a lot of the, the, the territory that they would like to start to extract resources from. And China is claiming something interesting. China, China is claiming um, vicinity to um, the, the area. So they also want to claim part of that. That is something that is written in this particular book from this um, uh, Heritage House, this Republican think tank, as a consideration that the next president of the United States needs to take into account and work on um, improving. Um, any Anything that you would like to say about this, uh, either space or, or the North Pole that... Could well, benefit space is really interesting because um, America has this claim that it wants to weapon. It does want to weaponize space. They created, um, and, and I'm not talking about the movie. I'm talking about the philosophy of Star Wars. They created that before. I don't know if it was before or after the movie, but they 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 wanted to have uh, a, a space. They have a space force, and it's now four or five. It's probably five years old, six years old now. Um, where, where they, and again, it was a Trump initiative to launch this space force. So they have a group of people in their military that are focused on space. China, on the other hand, has nothing of the sort. It has made many representations to NASA. It is, it is, it wanted to work with NASA. The Wolf Amendment stopped that from happening. And then when China came back with its rocks from the moon, NASA said, we hope they will share with everybody. And <clears throat> China said, yeah, we will. But unfortunately, <laughs> not with you. We can't. <laughs> Because of the Wolf Amendment. Sorry. <laughs> Your law, not ours. <clears throat> you know, if China had said, we can't share with you, America could be upset. They're not. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, so, so to wrap up a little bit with, with this whole uh, Project 2025 is and what we are very likely going to be facing once Donald Trump gets uh, elected come November. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't see any reason why he won't, particularly after what happened uh, to 48 hours ago. What I can tell you and share with you is that the attacks on China will continue. Yeah. Um, they're going to continue highlighting China's, uh, alleged violations of Philippines exclusive economic zone. Um, they're going to continue pumping out these accusations of violations of human rights. Um, they will continue attacking China along the lines of what takes place in Xinjiang, uh, the Hong Kong situation and Taiwan, of course. They will continue to talk about BRI and, and, um, and BRICS and talk about the weaponization of sovereign debt. They will continue to counter China's efforts to come closer to uh, Central America and the Caribbean and South America, um, it's, it's inevitable. This is not going to stop because what you do when you, are, when you are on the way down is kick harder so that you don't drown. That's the best picture that I can give you. Um, what, what are your final thoughts and uh, what are your concerns about this? My biggest concern is my throat right now. <clears throat> Just had a coughing <laughs> fit and muted the, the microphone. Um, the biggest concern is what will happen, <clears throat> or what might happen, what will happen. <clears throat> I cannot see anything getting better right now. <clears throat> NATO is expanding. That's, that's a given. That's what they're there for right now, talking in Washington. So NATO is expanding. We're seeing a potential new candidacy. Whether Biden wins, which is extremely unlikely, or whether Trump wins, the only change is going to be a surface change. <clears throat> Everything you just said there, the, the, the trade, trade, it's not, trade war is not going to finish. The expansion of military is not going to finish. The Philippines, the South China Sea, they're not going to finish. None of those things are going to finish. So the biggest thing that we have now is we, we can work towards peace. But I don't think anybody on that side of the Atlantic wants to do so, or that side of the Pacific. On this side, China has done nothing ever other than ask for cooperation, harmony in the world. And all they get is accusations, allegations, bullets and bombs. 
And, and there are bullets and bombs hitting China right now in, in various different places like Pakistan, the Pakistan Economic Corridor. <clears throat> there, there are things going on in that region. Things are going on in Africa that are militarily and Western influenced. All, all these things that are happening, they're not happening in vacuums. And you know, China is not anybody's enemy. It doesn't need to be. But when you have an enemy like America, they will fund smaller enemies to harass you. And that is what's happening now. And I think it was Xi Jinping said it to von der Leyen. America would like, uh, the, the report is, America would like me to invade Taiwan. I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> I'm not going to put the bait. <laughs> that's right well jerry thank you so very much for joining me today on this video and uh, for explaining this project 2025 um i hope that everybody joins <laughs> a very important website that jerry is a part of and that i am a collaborator which is multipolarity peace uh if i'm correct uh it's a group of people who are working on letting people know the threat of NATO coming to Asia, number one, and pushing for peace and multipolarity and trying to explain to people the importance of it and how to achieve it. Um, it's it's a website that you should all go to and follow and uh, inform yourselves of what can be done and what is taking place in real time, because these are people that are very highly informed about what is taking place. So I invite everybody to go there and take a look and follow what they say um and well without further ado guys thank you so much for uh joining us today on this very long uh chat i hope that your throat gets better jerry and uh well make sure to leave us a uh, comments and question share this and uh well until we see you again take it easy and bye for now jerry bye for now <laughs> take care <laughs>